This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. And thank you all for uh, your interest in this topic. Um, it, it's perplexing that each of us have a framework in our own minds about what the problems are that confront California. I'm going to suggest to you uh, a list that I think is an important one to focus on. Uh, it's one that California Forward is focusing on, obviously others have focused, and, and it deals with three related problems. And these problems have been brought to us by history. There's no one reason why each of them is here. We have a problem with the, the way in which the state budget is configured and allocated and how it allocates resources. We have a problem with our general revenue structure, not just state taxes, but local taxes as well. And then we have this annoying problem of the state-local fiscal relationship. And any of you who know that history know that we had a period of time when we had a doctrine that we followed, and that was that state taxes were used for state purposes and local taxes were lo used for local purposes. In the uh, l latter part of the 19th century, uh, the state had this general control over community governments. So a community government that wanted to do something had to go to the state for a statute in order to authorize it to do so. And we passed all that after the 1879 Constitution. We got into the turn of the century, and the legislature placed a measure on the ballot. The legislature placed a measure on the ballot in 1910 that separated sources. It said state taxes are used for state purposes and local taxes are used for local purposes. And that doctrine basically lasted although revised in, in, uh, in the 30s, lasted until we got into the late 70s, arguably not just because of Prop 13, but in the early 70s as well, where the state had larger and larger influences over community governments and the way in which they finance local services. So we've got this state-local relationship mess that's, that affects the way in which the revenue structure uh, is organized and affects the state budgeting process. About 75% of state expenditures go to some form of locally administered activity. About half of that amount for the schools and about a third of that amount for counties for the purpose of administering state obligations. Remember that our governmental scheme in California has the state with some statewide interests. Sometimes we wonder if they have their interests are statewide. We have counties that are agents of the state. They were brought to us as agents of the state in 1849. They are still agents of the state and they will be, continue to be so. We have city governments, or community governments, if you will, that have some independent power that was brought to us during the progressive period. And some of you that know municipal history know that we've had this long tradition of the home rule doctrine. Uh, of the 480 states, we have about 85, per, about 85 of them are charter cities. About 85% of the population lives in a charter city. Those charters have some independence from uh, state action. But, but that has not been the protection that some would argue is necessary in order to rationally think about the state-local relationship. Because over the last 25 years, it's changed considerably. So we're suggesting that those three problems are, are uh, interrelated and need to be considered together. And uh, I want to put up uh, a slide here to identify why I think this is a problem and why there's this lack of accountability. Uh, income taxes are, are a state levy tax. The state occupied that field in the 1930s and they've kept occupying it. We've changed the nature of it over time, but basically that's a state tax. It's used for state purposes. A good bit of it winds up in the state purpose of how it finances K-12 education because K-12 education is, uh, has been viewed by the courts and is viewed by the state over time as the highest priority of state expenditures. Read the 1849 Constitution. What's the highest priority of state expenditures in the 1849 Constitution? Anybody know? Schools. Education, exactly, schools. So it's always been a high priority. So a good bit of that income tax winds up in K-12 education. Uh, there's a good bit of it that winds up in county obligations as state agents to administer state programs, so uh, we understand that. The sales tax, everybody loves the sales tax. Now, keep in mind for you tax folks here that uh, which of those taxes are deductible against your federal income tax and which aren't? And one of the reasons, I don't have a whole lot of hair on the top of my 
uh, forehead is because I, I'm a head slapper and go, why on earth do we simply rely, have such high reliance on the sales tax when it's not deductible, all right? So we, have, we, uh, we know that the income tax and the property tax is deductible, as is the vehicle license fee, but when we cut that, so we cut a tax that's deductible. Um, the sales tax is not deductible, hasn't been deductible in 25 years, I guess, since the 80. Um, so everybody uses the sales tax as a revenue source. We have one of the highest sales tax rates in the state, uh, in, in the country, and the reason for that isn't the state rate it's that rather than having a state system for financing our state and community governments that's separated, if you will, like the separation of sources idea, um, instead what we've got is we use the sales tax to stack uh, tax uh, authority. So the state's got a 5% tax rate. We have this uh, temporary tax of one, one cent on at the moment. And then we've said, gee, for investments in transportation, we're not going to raise the gas tax. Can't do that. We can't set aside tax revenue necessarily for transportation. We want community governments, county governments, or uh, on a countywide basis to finance transportation. So we have all these uh, additional tax rates for, for transportation. And that's how we've been financing uh, uh, most of our transportation improvements has been through the sales tax on, on gasoline, A, and B, the general sales tax that applies uh, to, uh, uh, that, that's levied for transportation purposes that applies to everything. I didn't want to mix up the sales tax on gasoline with the general sales tax rate. Um, the property tax is my, probably my worst example. This was the tax that um, has always been a, uh, the source of much uh, complaint and concern over time. Uh, a good bit of our uh, uh, political angst over time is credited to problems with the property tax. You can go back and look at the 19th century and what happened at the, co at the convention in 1879 about the Board of Equalization and how county assessors hated the state because the, county, the state used to levy a property tax rate, all right? It was a mess. So we separated this and said cities and counties and school districts can levy the property tax. That goes on fine. Prop 13 comes along and does three things. It sets up a, a maximum tax rate. It sets up a new acquisition-based uh, assessment system. And the thing that we don't talk about a lot, but I remind people, is that gave the state the, the power to allocate the property tax. So it's part of the state fisc. It's part of the state fiscal structure. The state didn't used to care about it. Now, they cared about it a little bit with schools because they wanted property tax rates to help finance the schools, but now the state allocates the property tax. So I'm suggesting to you that there's a series of problems that are, are related within the uh, revenue structure, within the budgeting structure, and obviously with uh, respect to the local finance scheme. So those are my problems that I'd offer to everyone, and hopefully that'll generate some discussion. Thank you very much. Now to Mark Paul. Thank, thank you, Steve. Um, sometimes I think that we Californians maybe have a hard time figuring out what's wrong with the state because we're too close to the problem. And, and, and maybe we're even like my 82-year-old father-in-law who called us the other day to tell us how, how sick he is. Uh, he's made the same call to us every week for the past 20 years, but he's yet to find a doctor who agrees with him. Um, so I thought maybe what we ought to do today is try to step back and, and look for an out, outside opinion. Uh, how might an analyst sent here from another world uh, think of him as an extraterrestrial Alexis de Tocqueville, um, somebody well-read in California history and deeply versed in political practices around the globe, how would he diagnose California's ailments? First of all, our Tocqueville, and let's just call him E.T. for short, um, would not fail to notice the economic and human dynamism of this place, a state where the leading industries are all on the cutting edge of the global economy, enjoy the advantage of sitting on the Pacific, looking to Asia, which is where the, 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 I think the history of the 21st century is going to be written. Um, he'd see a state of entrepreneurs that places more of its small a share of a small private companies on the Inc. magazine annual list of the fastest growing companies. He'd see a, a young state in an aging country, um, which will be a, which you can't tell from this panel, but uh, uh, I just, well, just want to let the, the, the students from Cupertino know that I'm, I'm here speaking for you today. Uh, 
uh, he'd see a young state in an aging country, um, which will be a substantial advantage uh, in the years ahead, provided we can get serious about giving those young people the education they'll need to compete in that global economy. Now, yes, he'd see, see the for sale signs on the bank repoed houses and the high unemployment rates. Uh, but you know, UC Press has decided to name its new journal about California, Boom, but RET would know that to be true to California's history, every ever other issue of that journal should be called Bust, um, which would also, I think, surely help up drive up their Google searches. But the point is that California has been through this before and we generally come out just fine. But politics, I think, is a less happy story. Like many of our homegrown seers, our ET would note California's political polarization. Uh, this is no longer Earl Warren or Pat Brown's California, where liberals were sometimes Republicans and conservatives were often Democrats. Californians now have swung their partisan identities more in line with their ideological preferences and in addition, they've clumped themselves into communities of the like-minded, creating a whole new political geography for the state with a solid sea of democratic blue lapping in a red inland California of valleys and mountains. I think it was very nice of Berkeley today to issue a visa so Joel could join us. <laughs> but our, our analysts would be quick to remember that California is not unique in this. You can see the same polarization going on all across the country, um, but in many other places without producing quite the same kind of governing paralysis that we see in California. So our ET would look deeper to factors unique to California. He would see a California that has outgrown its inherited political institutions. Its population has soared 40-fold since the 1879 Constitutional Convention laid the foundation of our state government, 16-fold since Hiram Johnson uh, gave us the initiative and direct democracy process. Oh, it has doubled in size since the last major constitutional revision in the 1960s. He would also note that California, uh, the, the century and a half long flood of immigrants to the state from all the corners of the nation and the earth turning California into a society of unrivaled human diversity. These demographic upheavals have distanced our representatives in Sacramento from the represented and strained the ability of old institutions like our tiny legislature to accurately reflect the richness of California's tapestry. On closer examination though, he would come to a more troubling diagnosis, deep political schizophrenia. On the one hand, he would see a system of single-member legislative districts elected by plurality vote, much like the rest of the country. This system, and we can say this here in the political science department, is, is well known to restrict representation to the two major parties. It's known to exaggerate the majority party's strength and to empower the ideological basis in each of the major parties. And all, it also renders moot the votes of millions of Californians in our elections. You know, if you're a Republican in the Bay Area, you don't count. If you're a Democrat in the, in the CR Foothills or the Inland Empire, you're, you might as well never vote for a legislative office. This, system, this system's driving principle, its principle is out of the voices of many, create a majority to speak for all of us. And it does that task very well. In, for instance, in the California Assembly, it is possible to pass a bill with the support of members who won their first election to the state capitol with the votes of fewer than 10% of the registered voters in their district. For instance, uh, Assemblyman John Perez won his assembly seat in a primary last year by receiving in a safe Democratic seat in Los Angeles 5,000 votes in a primary election in a district that has a half million people. So there's no doubt that our, our system is great at assembling majorities, whether it is as good at accurately representing the full range of California's views, I think is another matter entirely. So that's the first hand. And on the second hand, our ET would see superimposed upon this first system, a second political system, a constitutional web 
of fiscal rules uh, requiring supermajority legislative agreement about the very subjects, spending and taxes, over which the electorate is most closely divided. The driving principle of this second system, don't trust the elected majority to rule. Do nothing important without broad consensus. And then on the third hand, and here's why it pays to have an extraterrestrial Tocqueville, he'd see uh, another system that the voters have repeatedly used the initiative process, another majoritarian institution, to override the legislature's decisions which were made by consensus. And that, and that consensus process was originally put in place as a check on majority rule. So California voters by majority vote have piled mandate on mandate, reform on reform, spending increase on tax cut, creating a government too complex for any earthling to understand. And I think it is the collision of these two syst three systems and two contradictory governing principles, one majoritarian, one consensus, that has produced gridlock, rising debt, and political schizophrenia. And the schizophrenia comes with all the textbook symptoms, including apathy, delusions, disordered thinking, and if you doubt me, just check out a comment section on a newspaper website, and the kind of citizen anger that marked the May special elections. On the occasions where we California can agree broadly, we cope pretty well. But on the subjects on which we are most closely divided, especially involving money, California doesn't work because it can't work. Thank you. Thank you. Joel Fox. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the visa, allowing me in. Um, I, I do remember, I think I, the last time I was in this room, uh, I recalled the one time I was here that I fondly remember when my audience was made up of elected officials from around the country and the person next to me had just been the proponent of the term limits initiative and all of their anger and arrows went to him and uh, they could care less about me. So, well, but I'm back to my normal role, I guess. Um, uh, first question I would ask on what's ailing California is how representative is our representative government? And Bruce Kane here at Berkeley has done some thinking about this when he talks about we have two electorates in California one filtered through the legislative elections, and the second one, the direct electorate, partially through, you know, with our direct democracy. And these two electorates don't often agree. And they have different opinions on taxes, quite often, different opinions on crime and punishment, a number of items uh, up and down. There's difference of, of opinion with, of the electorate as a whole versus what might be produced out of the legislature. And I wonder if that's a reason for the low ratings that Jack talked about this morning uh, for uh, the legislative body. Uh, one thing that may improve on this, perhaps, is the June primary ballot open primary measure that could produce a legislature that's more reflective of the larger electorate as a whole and maybe change some of those numbers. The second thing I would note is that it's very hard to make changes because of the turf wars in many different agencies and groups who always defend their own turf. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger put me on the California Performance Review Commission. Uh, that's the blow up the boxes deal that never really was carried through. And sitting at all those commission hearings, everybody was fighting, everyone said that their way of doing things, their way of protecting the electorate, their way of protecting the voters was the right way. So the local water agencies would fight with the state water agency. And you see this carried on time and time again. I, I saw another example just this week. Uh, I teach uh, one day a week at Pepperdine in a public policy course. And Peter's been to my class speaking and Fred's been to my class speaking and I can't forget Sherry because she'll never let me. Sherry, who you're gonna hear from later. And Joe Matthews over there. So yes, I bring in a lot of speakers because I can't give a four hour lecture. But uh, on Monday, I had Ben Austin, and Ben is running an organization in Los Angeles called the Parent Revolution, and it's a parents' union to oppose, well, oppose is probably not the right word, but to, to make improvements with the Los Angeles Unified School District, and to take on the teachers' union in Los Angeles, 
particularly on the front on charter schools. Now, Ben is no wild right-wing reactionary. He is a self-described progressive Democrat who worked in the Clinton White House, who was political aide to Rob Reiner and all his education methods, but he, he sees a way to improve education in Los Angeles, and that is through this parents, this, these charter schools, and the teachers union will protect their turf. So he is creating a parents union to try to offset that. And you see that there are time and time again, there are examples like that. Third item I want to talk about is probably the one I was brought up to talk about, brought up here to talk about, that's the spending and taxes issue. Obviously, I believe uh, that we need more, stronger spending controls. You know, a professor a few years ago did a study on uh, hearings at Appropriations Committee, and he said that 96% of the people who testify want more from government. They want government to fund their programs. And it's sometimes hard for the legislators to say no. A congressman at the beginning of the 1800s once said profoundly that uh, one of life's delicious pleasures is spending other people's money. And I think that happens too often and causes us to have a spending problem in California. You're going to hear from, hear from Bill Lockyer, uh, who's been making some news this week. Uh, you're going to hear from him a little later. I listened to him Tuesday down in, Los, in Beverly Hills at the Milken Institute conference where he talked about we need a spending limit in California. And yesterday, in front of the commission, uh, the hearing up in Sacramento, uh, he talked about the pensions, health benefits being unsustainable in the public sector. And he went on to say, and I had this note previously, but I'll, since Bill's a Democrat, I'll quote him, uh, that, that the problem of the public unions electing essentially their bosses and then negotiating with them is driving our spending problem here in California and skewing the, the negotiations and leads to more spending. The question of the tax system not producing enough revenue, I don't agree with. Um, I don't think we have a revenue problem. Since 1980, population inflation in California has increased 200%. The state general funds increased 340%. And even with the caps of property taxes, they've increased 500%. And we have raised taxes under the system. California had the largest tax increase of any state in history in February, $12 billion. Not working out very well, by the way. As you know, the controller a few days ago said that we're about a billion dollars short over the last three months. I also reviewed the results of local elections. Where the voters have a say. And for 2008, 69% of the sales taxes passed. 81% of the utility taxes passed. 59% of the parcel taxes, those are property taxes that require a two-thirds vote. 59% passed. So if you make your case, the voters will respond, and we are not shutting off taxes with the system that we put in place. Um, on, someone told me yesterday that um, they saw a bu bumper sticker here in Berkeley which some of you probably would agree with, that says, Save California, repeal Proposition 13. Uh, and I wanted to comment on Prop 13 because uh, we were asked to, uh, for the panel, Steve asked us if we would talk about some of the arguments made against some of the issues that we talk for. Prop 13 has obviously been accused of, with its two-thirds vote, of being undemocratic, on two-thirds vote on taxes being undemocratic, and being unfair and unequal. On the two-thirds vote issue, I would argue that in our democratic republic, we often seek supermajority votes to reach consensus, uh, to convict an impeached officer is a two-thirds vote, to pass a treaty is a two-thirds vote in the federal constitution. In fact, the federal constitution has 10 times as a two-thirds vote. There's a unanimous vote in some jury trials. Sometimes we want a supermajority vote to reach consensus, and I would argue that in taking taxes, you're taking property from folks in the form of taxes, and a two-thirds vote is appropriate in those instances. As, as far as the fairness question, I would talk about certainty, for, uh, the certainty issue of um, what Prop 13 set up. Adam Smith said, certainty of what each individual ought to pay in taxation is a matter of so great importance that a very considerable degree of inequality is not as great an evil as a small degree of uncertainty. 
I would suggest to you that Proposition 13 did one revolutionary thing. It gave certainty to the taxpayer instead of the tax collector. And I don't see that the people will surrender that so easily. But I, as I've made this argument many times over for the last 20 years, if you want to change 13 or if you want to eliminate it, put it on the ballot. It doesn't take a two-thirds vote. It's 50% plus one. Thank you. Joel, thank you. And now our cleanup batter, Peter Schrag. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, uh, Chancellor Bergenau this morning uh, uh, commented that our uh, subject today, what ails California, couldn't have been better timed. And he's right about that. But it could have also been very well timed at almost any time in the last 30 years. Um, uh, we've been uh, going down this road now, um, and I won't, I won't start with Prop 13, um, but, um, but certainly uh, this chart that Fred Silver first put up about the confounding of, um, uh, of uh, tax authority and so on, uh, a lot of that came from Prop 13. It had nothing to do with spending. It had to do with the structure of government and the way government works. Um, so, um, uh, and I think uh, still to this day, uh, maybe especially in this day, I, I think uh, what California suffers from is a combination of too much democracy and too little democracy. Uh, too little democracy in terms of the discretion that the legislature has, and that has to do with taxation limits, the two-thirds uh, budget limit, um, uh, term limits, uh, Proposition 98, uh, a, a whole series of things that essentially either require or restrict the legislature uh, from doing certain things. Um, uh, it's like the old joke about what is, a, what is a Prussian? A Prussian is someone who believes that everything that's not forbidden is required. Um, and I think we have something like this um, uh, in California. Um, uh, we haven't uh, talked about ballot box budgeting, or at least I don't recall we did. Uh, but that's certainly part of it, um, uh, it the process by which, we, uh, by which the voters basically approve spending uh, programs without uh, any revenues to pay for them. Uh, and a lot of those have been sold on that basis. Uh, you can have this and it won't raise your taxes. Um, uh, there is an incredible lack of accountability, partly because of the supermajority requirements, um, which uh, uh, allows uh, where you, you really can't tell anymore uh, who's caused the gridlock. Is it the majority in the legislature, Democrats, or is it the Republicans who has exercised eff effectively a veto? And we have, uh, I, I think that's another strange thing in a democracy, is that we have um, uh, a majority uh, which has granted a minority a veto power over its decisions, essentially, which is what the, the two-thirds thing and and attempts have been made to change that change that over the years uh, they've all failed um, uh, because the voters I think despite their constant complaints about the legislature not doing its job I think the voters really like things not to happen too fast and not to happen too radically and too drastically and as Joel said we do have two electorates we have the electorate that chooses the legislature which tends to be more Democrat, democratic uh, because districts are apportioned by population and not by voters, um, and an electorate that, uh, a statewide electorate uh, that votes on ballot measures. Uh, and those two are not in agreement, and I think that's also part of the reason for our gridlock. Um, the, um, uh, uh, and I think the whole issue of, um, uh, the, uh, I think the other gap here is that we have the, the California population, as you know, is majority minority. It's now what 42 percent non-Hispanic white, something like that. Um, uh, so within a generation or two, it'll be majority uh, Latino if we can still make those counts at that point. Um, and uh, so, uh, the 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 voter, the uh, the population, is a minority uh, as non-Hispanic whites. The electorate is still overwhelmingly non-Hispanic whites by something like 65 percent. Uh, I'm not sure at the last count. Um, and so you have, uh, you have that gap. That gap, I think, is compounded by the fact that the, 
population tends to be uh, disproportionately, uh, 26 or 27 percent of our population is immigrants, uh, many of them uh, undocumented immigrants. Um, there seems to be a fair amount of data uh, around the world, and to some extent in, Calif in California, that the more diverse a society is and the more uh, the, the public as a whole doesn't look like you, the voter, uh, the more reluctant you are to vote generous public goods uh, for the society as a whole. If the, if the beneficiaries of schools or parks or whatever it is um, tend, could be you or your family or your, some relative or somebody you know, you're much more likely to support those programs than if they uh, are somebody who is an other. And I think that is something that uh, we haven't yet fully taken into account when we think about this. Um, that will change over time. Um, uh, obviously, the, the election of Barack Obama, um, uh, largely on the strength of minority voters, uh, is an indication that it's going to change, but it will change um, uh, slowly. Um, uh, we, uh, again, going back 30 years um, to Jack Citrin's title, Something for Nothing, um, I think when Prop 13 passed, the legislature bailed out, began to bail out local governments, which is also, of course, part of the reason that we have this compounding of, of uh, accountability and roles and so on. But it also did something else. It taught the voters um, that they could essentially cut their taxes with impunity or not raise their taxes and still have good services. And we managed to muddle along on that basis with borrowing, with fudging, with, uh, with uh, transfer of uh, accounts and all the rest of it until we ran out of all the gimmicks, which is basically what happened in the last year or two. Um, but, but, but in the process, uh, we did educate the voters to come out, come up with some of the uh, poll data uh, that Jack Citrin showed this morning, uh, which is that basically um, the people think they can have the same the same level of services with less revenue um, uh, than they do now uh, because there's waste, fraud, and abuse, um, which is, of course, an old, familiar uh, complaint in, in democracies. But, but I think that uh, the voters have been, uh, I think if the legislature had not bailed out local government on day one when local property taxes were cut by close to 60 percent, uh, maybe the electorate would have a different approach to its public goods than it does now. Um, and it's perfectly clear that uh, the, the, the largest level of mistrust is of state government. Local government, I think, enjoys more support, which is why a lot of the local bond uh, uh, and other tax measures uh, pass at the local level, uh, where they very likely uh, might have problems. Certainly, if the legislature appropriate tries to appropriate money, um, uh, or to raise taxes for money that it controls. Um, so I think in this whole, in this whole um, uh, list, I think the, the bottom line is this very strange combination that we have, which no other state really has, um, of, um, uh, of uh, hyper-democracy and too little democracy. Uh, and, uh, and it seems to me those two things are very much in conflict with one another. Um, and I think it's part of, partly uh, the reason the, for the gridlock that, we've, uh, we, that we have. Thanks, I'm stuck. I'm, I'll be done. Thank you, Peter. Uh, before we turn to the audience for questions, I'd like to uh, pose a question for our panelists to discuss that builds both on what they've said and also the data that Jack Citrin showed us earlier. Uh, we've heard Fred talk about the structure of finance in California. Mark talked about the structure of representation. And if I heard him correctly at the end, I think he suggested that problems with representation have induced a kind of popular disorientation uh, with, with respect to government. Joel talked about competing electorates. Uh, the need to reflect the electorate as a whole and the power of pro-spending constituents. And Peter talked about the structure of government and the lack of a shared community interest. Uh, 
the dominant answer to what ails California tends to be that it is a failure of government institutions, particularly at the state level. And the common assertion is that state government does not represent the will of the people. This in turn leads to discussions of ideas such as different methods of electing the legislature, calling a constitutional convention, and so on. The question I'd like to pose, and again referring back to the data we saw earlier this morning, is to ask what share of California's ailments come from the people themselves? I'm thinking, for example, of the delight the voters take in passing expensive initiatives financed by future bonds or with no source of financing whatsoever, the lack of political participation, including people giving money to campaigns that they support, the disinclination of the populace to face up to hard long-term problems such as putting California on a budget path that is fiscally sustainable. Uh, if the electorate were parents and the child was California, uh, I ask the question whether these are responsible parents. So the question I'd like to pose is, can we fix a significant part of the problems that have been discussed until or unless the people of California want them fixed? And I throw that open to any of our panelists who'd like to take a crack at it. Peter? Well, I, I would agree, and I think, that's, I think that's what I was trying to say before, is that is that the electorate, despite its complaints about a, a non-functioning legislature, in fact, doesn't really mind having a non-functioning legislature. Um, uh, and, and every attempt to, uh, every reform that have, has been proposed at the ballot box has been rejected. A lot of them have been flawed, to be sure, uh, but they were rejected. And I, I think about, for example, um, uh, the, the state of Massachusetts at the turn of the uh, 20th century, uh, when the Irish were beginning to take over uh, and when the old Yankees were trying to protect their residual pro uh, uh, power, and they created all these institutions to make it harder for the Irish to govern, basically. And I think to some extent that's what we've done here uh, in the face of uh, this new um, uh, population that's uh, growing up and around and under us, um, many of them immigrants, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and the attempt, I think, in many of the things that we've done, not, it's not racist, it's not racial, it's simply, um, uh, it's simply an electorate that was used to one kind of world that is now being intimidated and worried and feels besieged by another world. Other panelists. Yeah, uh, Steve, I think um, a short answer to the question of how to get the voters involved in their policymaking apparatus, because they have a parallel power to the legislature, uh, is to have them make the same tough choices that the legislature and governors are often faced with, which is you have a new idea, you ought to finance it. So it seems to me that you could say in the initiative process that you have to identify the f financing source for that new obligation. And uh, unfortunately, initiative proponents tend to want to say, well, we don't, raise ta we don't have to raise taxes because it's the general fund that will take care of it. And the legislative analyst is kind enough to give you an estimate of what the cost of the general fund is. But unfortunately, there's no organized group out there to help protect the general fund. There's no friends of the general fund. For those of you who'd like to participate in that, I'm going to be a charter member and sign up. Uh, so you, you ought to at least have the voters confront the question of this is a high enough priority, then, then you ought to fund it. Now, keep in mind that the legislature is not pure here, because often the legislature creates for itself obligations that aren't financed. We have a line, nice long list of them where they think, well, uh, general fund growth will take care of that. Uh, or what they do is divert revenue from uh, uh, a given source to give to another and put that on the ballot. Uh, Prop 42 is my favorite example where they took a piece of the sales tax on, that's on applied to gasoline and handed it to transportation. The voters were simply uh, asked, this isn't going to increase your taxes. We want to see if you could pledge some of your sales tax to transportation. 
So I think measures that the voters confront ought to have some financing mechanism for them. Joel? Um, it's a chicken and egg question. Is the legislature ineffective because it's tied up by initiatives? Or uh, are the initiatives a response to an ineffective legislature? I would argue it's a little bit of both. I think it started with the um, legislature uh, being uh, inactive on important questions and initiatives came along in response to that. So ultimately, I will blame the legislature, but I will also defend them today and say they have their job complicated by initiatives uh, because clearly um, when one measure is added to another measure, they don't exactly sync up. And that makes the job difficult. So uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, how do you fix that? Uh, I will go back to my first point. I think if you have a, a legislature that's reflective uh, of the voters in getting things done, Mr. Treasurer, um, that uh, uh, we will um, we will see uh, people respond more positively to the legislature. And uh, in that way, uh, maybe we can break the gridlock. Mark, any final comment? Um, well, I'm prepared to stipulate it if we could take the population of Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota and substitute it for the people of California that we probably have. Th they'd take one look at the system of ours and says, you've got to be crazy. But uh, you know, not facetiously. I mean, a lot of those people did come here, um, and they got deranged. Um, I mean, Los, An Los Angeles, this, there must be something in the sunshine. I mean, Los Angeles was settled a lot by a lot of Iowans, and they've turned into Californians. But I, I don't think the Californians, you know, it's a pe people that were more eager to have something for nothing. It's a, a human trait. You know, it's, it goes with the fall of man um, to want something for nothing. But... But uh, I think the diff diff part of the difficulty goes back to what I said about the scale of our growth in California. I mean, we have always, always been a state of arrival, you know, that so much of our population was born elsewhere and came here looking for something particular. Um, and it's very different for the most of the states of the country, which are the political cultures are more enduring, They're, they don't change as rapidly. Uh, we've had this tremendous growth in California that is, and, and we have, and, and the sheer size you know, makes California not work as a political community. Um, we have very few ways of communicating with, with one another. You know, unlike most states, you know, most states have a single large media market, for instance, so that, you know, if you're communicating in Chicago or in Indianapolis or, or New York City or whatever, you're reaching the whole state. I mean, California is very hard. We don't have a lot of the, the statewide mediating institutions. The progressives killed off the political parties in California, so we don't have the deep uh, history of political participation that a lot of other states do. Um, and, and the University of California, for instance, doesn't play the same role in the state's life that the land-grant universities play in a lot of the Midwestern states. I mean, it would be unthinkable in, in Wisconsin, you know, to, to, to close down the university's, you know, uh, center at the state capitol um, um, because the university and the state are together. But the U University of California, when they're making budget cuts, prioritize keeping a center in Washington, D.C., and they close down their center in Sacramento. I mean, California, you know, we have a difficult time being a political community because we're so large. And Peter, as Peter said, the diversity makes it even more difficult. This is a question for Joel Fox also. I assume you're in the um, solve the budget problem by cutting waste, fraud, and abuse camp. And I would like to know what your top three priorities are for cutting uh, government spending that would amount to at least, say, a billion dollars. Because I suspect that if voters were asked, uh, do you want to cut taxes and increase class size to 40 or 50 to uh, triple the uh, tuition at the University of California, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I myself would be willing to let a lot of people out of jail to reduce the number of, uh, of prison guards, but what, what would you cut? Well, I'm going to surprise you. I actually supported Proposition 1A on the ballot, which would have continued the taxes for two more years and put in the spending limit in the reserve. I also wrote a, I also wrote a chapter uh, for uh, UC Berkeley's e e press here 
which talked about accepting uh, releasing early release of some prisoners. So uh, don't assume that I buy into that argument that uh, the that the that it's all waste and it should all all should be taken care of by cutting waste because that's not my position. Okay, one last question. There's one way in the back. Students. Yeah. Did somebody else want to get in on the panel? No. Um, California has over 500 amendments in its constitution, and it has been said that in comparison with revising the whole constitution, these specific amendments um, hardly do anything to actually amend uh, California. Um, what are your thoughts on this, and is it a problem? Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get all the details, but uh, you're interested in this problem of amending the California constitution and yeah. how many amendments it's had? Yes. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, there's a, a kind of a, um, a standard operating theme uh, when we talk about amending the Constitution. The assumption is that it's the initiative process that's made a mess of the thing, and that there was a time when it was in better shape. Um, uh, remember, we had an intervening period between the 1879 Constitution and the current Constitution where we had a Constitution Revision Commission in the 1960s that did a pretty good job of winnowing out some of the provisions that were in there that ought to be in statute, and they worked for a whole decade to do that. Um, you'd be surprised at the number of amendments to the Constitution that are simply placed there by statute, uh, I'm sorry, but by the legislature. Um, and I have, don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's uh, over half of the amendments to the Constitution since 1911, because that's when we started the initiative process, were put there by the legislature. So uh, I, I think we need to have some perspective here about uh, how complicated our Constitution is and how it got complicated. Obviously, there are requirements there that were placed there by the, by the voters through the initiative process, but we've had a lot of provisions that are I have complicated things that were placed there by the legislature as well. But they were approved by the voters. A and approved by the voters. Yeah. I think they were, but I, I think the Chief Justice the other day said there were 500 amendments in, to the Constitution, something like that. Huh? Remember that only about a third of the measures that the, con that, the le that the initiative measures that the people consider get approved. Um, so. The, the reason the Constitution is so junked up is, is in part because people, people like Joel, who have policy preferences, you know, and I don't, and this is right, left, it's everybody. If you've got a policy preference, if you really want to win your battle, what you want to do is you want to put it in the Constitution because it's, the legislature can't change it. You know, it, it takes a two-thirds of the vote then, you know, to put another, or and there's a higher vote standard, a higher signature standard to pass a constitutional amendment to take something out. So we've had, part, it's been part of the political game in California to try to embed your policy preference in the fundamental law instead of just statute, which the statute, you know, somebody might fiddle with. I mean, so, so, uh, um, you know, that's why we've gone that, dire gone that direction. It's just been part of our political game. Let me just pick up on Mark's accusation here. Um, <laughs> if anyone bothered to look at uh, my bio, you'll notice that I was a proponent of Proposition 218, the right to vote on taxes. I want to give you a little history on that. Uh, the chief reason that that came about was because there was a creation of benefit assessments, which were a way to get around Prop 13, whether, where you can levy these assessments on property without having a vote of, uh, of the people. And uh, they got to be very extreme. They got, because uh, there was supposed to be some benefit to the property, yet they would say a park 30 miles away benefited the property, or a new scoreboard at a college football stadium somehow benefited your neighborhood property. We went to the legislature and introduced bills to try to control this benefit assessment problem multiple times. I remember Ross Johnson carried a couple of them. Uh, I think we had a Democratic co-author uh, on, on one of them. And we went back and back saying, this is not proper. We have to take care of this problem on mu multiple times. And they, it was not done through the legislature. And the problem got more extreme to the point where even the editorialists who don't always favor our point of view were pointing out how 
benefit assessments were abused. And then we went to the ballot with a constitutional amendment, uh, and the people supported it. So uh, it wasn't our first choice, it wasn't a knee-jerk choice, and it went over a course of many years before we made that decision, uh, after the legislature did not respond uh, to uh, multiple attempts to deal with the problem in their house. Peter? Um, one thing we should keep in mind here is that California is the only state in the nation uh, where a, a ballot measure, a statutory uh, a ballot measure, um, cannot be uh, amended or, uh, or changed by the legislature unless it provides for its own uh, revision. Um, so, in effect, statutory changes uh, tend to be almost the equivalent of constitutional changes because the legislature can't get at them um, unless the voters themselves decide to change them. Uh, we're going to give each of the panelists an opportunity to make a few concluding comments. Let me offer one thought which they may choose to respond to. Uh, we've heard a number of references this morning and in other places to the fact that California is a very large and diverse state. Part of the diversity, I think a very important part of the diversity in California is regional diversity. Folks in Fresno do not think about issues the same way folks in San Diego do, and they don't think the same way that folks in Eureka do. In the United States of America, which is a reasonably large and diverse nation, uh, we deal with that phenomenon through something called the states. And the states can handle problems in very different ways. I notice now in the national health care debate that one of the options being discussed to resolve the public option controversy is to give states the option of opting out or opting in to such a policy, recognizing that there are strong differing views by region. Uh, if you take California out of the equation, the average size of the other 49 states is 5.3 million people. By that metric, California represents seven states. For those who have traveled throughout California, you know there's at least seven regions, quite different. Uh, it strikes me that part of the problem of managing the state is that we are heavily over-centralized, that a lot of decisions are made in Sacramento that apply to the state as a whole, and there is no opportunity for regional option or divergence. And uh, that's a topic which conceivably could be dealt with by constitutional change, but I hear very little discussion about it. So I'd be interested to know if any of our panelists have any thoughts about that, but we're going to give each of them two minutes to say whatever they'd like to say in conclusion, and let's start with Peter, since he was last first. <laughs> um, I don't know that... Um, uh, uh, as you know, there's much talk about a constitutional convention. Um, and let me ask a question. How many people in this room think a constitutional convention would be a good idea? Thank you. Um, Let's I'd, ask how many are opposed. <laughs> oh, well, yes. So there are a fair number of people who haven't made up their minds. Okay. I should have allowed for that. Um, the. Uh, uh, I, I've been thinking about this uh, constitutional convention thing for a long time, and 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 I'm I've now decided that uh, marginally it might be a, a decent idea. Not because I think necessarily that any wonderful things will come from it, but because it might be a useful educational process for the California electorate. Um, the and because everything else has failed. All, all other alternatives have failed. And, and it seems to me, uh, and again, uh, looking at Jack's numbers this morning, uh, it tells you how difficult it is to get any kind of consensus uh, among the voters about anything. Um, so it seems to me that might, um, a constitutional convention, if it's done right, if it has the right people, lots of ifs, um, might uh, to some extent help raise the level of uh, understanding among the electorates. And uh, given all the things that have been said about the regions, about the diversity of the state, um, 
Um, we are, you know, incredible. We have no, we have a dozen or 15 media markets. Um, people in San Diego don't see television in Eureka. Um, so there are all those things. But, but it seems to me it might be worth doing. Let's go down the line. Fred, your concluding sure. comments. <clears throat> you know, we've all talked about, uh, this is the panel on ills and ailments. Um, and I want to, just a, an observation about uh, all of you and us who are interested in uh, changing the nature of either our governance apparatus or our fiscal uh, system. And uh, we, uh, I suggest the admonition to you that is given to all dragon slayers, and that is you have to pick your dragons carefully. And so when we think about what ails us, we need to think clearly about what is it that will bring about some institutional change. Obviously, the, on the governance side, we know that the redistrict, a new independent uh, redistricting commission might help kind of on the margins with respect to how legislative districts are drawn. We have an idea that maybe a top two primary might change that system, so we incrementally think about how the, how the, the some of this governance, some of these governance issues are settled. Uh, on the fiscal and state local finance issues, these are much more difficult because the Voters, it seems to me, don't have a whole lot of patience with trying to undo a relatively complex system, some of which they have made, some of which the legislature has made. So I think in the end, we all need to think about what is it that we want to put on as a, as a reform agenda and think about that not only as a one-time event but a multiple-time event, so it may be some issues that need to be dealt with in 2010 and then some issues to be dealt with in 2014. Um, we have a new governor taking office in 2011, so we have these new opportunities for renewal, and re just remember the admonition to dragon slayers. Joel. More likely to have an old governor taking office <laughs> in 2000. <laughs> um, we, we were supposed to talk about ailments, but I do believe there are solutions out there, so we'll leave that to the later panels. Uh, on your point, Steve, on regionalism, uh, it's one of the things that California Ford is looking at, uh, at least bringing more power back to the local level, and they have some good ideas, uh, and I think there will be some uh, effort to uh, organize regions a little better. Uh, on Tuesday, when I was at the uh, Milken Institute deal, um, where Treasurer Lockyer was uh, on the panel with Bob Hertzberg, and Bob talked about uh, California being equivalent to nine states on the eastern seaboard. And uh, you would think the politicians would think about breaking California up, think of all those Senate seats they could run for. But, uh, but I don't, that's unlikely. So I do think we're going to move towards some, re some regionalism I think is going to be on the table. I think if California Forward is successful with its localism and accountability, that uh, it may go from city to county to more larger regions. So I think that is a possibility. And I'll leave you with a question that draws on Jack's numbers from this morning. You know, the, and, and here's the, the fact background. In February, the legislature did a remarkable thing. You know, with the state in a really big crisis, the legislature, you know, and, and the treasurer had shut down all the lending to the to infrastructure projects. We were really in bad shape. The legislature in February passed the budget four months early for the current fiscal year. And now it was, it was an ugly budget, but it was the budget that they could reach consensus on under the rules that the people of California say they like. And so they came up with this, this budget, which required, in order to make it happen, the voters to assent at the May election to certain, certain of the provisions that they had come to a consensus on. And at the May election, the people who, on the left who didn't like the, the, the deal that was made and the people on the right who didn't like the deal was made said, no, go back, do it again. And so we got another budget, $6 billion or more cuts. And as a result, you know, the, the people of California now even think less of their legislature after having done exactly what the, the people told them to do. So the question is, can you imagine a different set of rules in California that we might have, you know, if, if there had been a majority vote budget in February that didn't require the voters to actually vote on it in May, Mike Jack's numbers for the legislative approval will be higher. That's, that's your homework. I hope you'll join me in thanking this panel.